Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker and currently I'm doing a PhD by film practice in UCL's anthropology department. I've spent over half my working life in the United States where I originally apprenticed and worked as a traditional wooden boat builder. And I went there in my early 20s, I went to Maine up in the Northeast and I ended up living there for 12 years. So you're probably wondering, why has Doc House invited someone who trained as a wooden boat builder to talk to you about self-shooting and story? Well, in parallel with the boat building, I've made a lot of films about craftsmanship, and that was before I came back to the UK to train at the NFTS, where I specifically wanted to learn how to construct a story. So my boat building experience and training really does inform how I approach teaching. Both are very experiential and I feel like you learn from doing. I'm going to use a lot of slides and just to warn you that my approach is quite didactic and the talk is aimed at new filmmakers. This talk is for everyone, whether you're using a smartphone, a, a smartphone, a DSLR, any type of camera, whatever stage you're at in your journey. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from and let's get into the talk. So the theme of the Bertha Doc House competition is re-emergence. And it feels like a loaded term. Some of us aren't yet re-emerging, others are. Each of us have our own very particular and individual circumstances. And each of these positions is completely valid. I see this competition as a terrific opportunity for you to share your perspectives about this current time and to tell a short story about it. I've just been one of a team of mentors on eight student films made in lockdown at the NFTS and to all of our surprise, despite the constraints put on us and put on the students by social distancing, they all made terrific work. So I've got every confidence that you're going to make some really wonderful films. So I'll just screen share my slides. So I've had the pleasure of watching some of your three previous exercise entries to the Bertha Dockhouse competition. And for those of you who are new, welcome. I'm going to divide the talk into two sections. And throughout the talk, I'll be addressing you as self-shooting directors. The filmmaking vocabulary I'll be using can be broken down into shots, sequences and scenes. I'm going to begin with a few tips about how to plan for your project. Then I'm going to show you some practical exercises that will learn, well, which will help you learn how to capture reality. And finally, we'll move on to a brief overview of some storytelling structuring basics. And that will just be the final 10 minutes or so of what's about a 40 minute talk. I'm going to use my graduation film from the NFTS as a bit of a case study for the story section and show you some of the mistakes that I made. The message I really want to get across is that filmmaking is often about learning to work with what you've got. It's not always a perfect business. And the point of today's talk is to give you some tools to learn about how to construct a story that has a beginning, middle and end. So before I just get into the practical tips, I'll just touch on planning. So, one way of approaching the brainstorming of your ideas is to start with listing the themes that you're interested in life. And, um, you know, you can start from an emotional place, personal emotional place is often a good place. So what are your themes? Could be gender, power, class, ethnicity, aging. And then think about who you want to make your film about. Who's your protagonist? Whose story is it? And quite importantly, and we'll keep coming back to this, whose point of view is your story being told from? It's also really helpful to write your idea down in one sentence. It's a story about, that's called a synopsis. And the final two points, think about why do I really want to make this film? And then finally, what do I need to shoot to tell this story? 
So the genre of documentary filmmaking I'm going to be teaching you about today is called observational documentary filmmaking. And it's different from presenter-led TV or journalism. Just because I'm talking about observational filmmaking principles today does not mean that you have to make your film observationally. It's entirely up to, do, up to you what genre you choose. You know, it could be an essay film, it could be, you know, gosh, any number of genres, but uh, presenter-led, it could be, it could be, um, yeah, you know, look at, look at different genres of documentary, participatory is another one. But today, this is really the filmmaking, the, the basics of observational. And the idea of today's talk is to run through some of the core principles of the observational approach. And they, these techniques are also widely used in television and journalism. So next is an example of how to shoot observationally. The beauty of observational filmmaking is that if you shoot reality observationally, it's a really great skill to have because it gives the audience a much more intimate and alive relationship to the subject. And the audience experiences the story as though they're actually there, which is very powerful. This observational experiential approach is the genre that filmmakers like Kim Longinotto specialize in. So just a quick warning that this clip is about domestic violence. And when you're watching, think about where Kim positions herself in the scene with the camera. And also, I want you to keep an eye out for when and how Kim reveals a new character in the scene. Okay, let's watch this clip. It's uh, quite a long one. It's about, I think, two minutes, two and a half minutes. خودش <laughs> <laughs> So it's quite an upsetting scene um, and one of the disadvantages of being with you on Zoom is that I can't read the room and see if any of you would like to comment on the clip. 
and I, you know, it's a, it's very powerful. And of course, in the Q and A, we can, um, you can please make some comments or, or ask any questions about it. So, Pan, um, in the clip, Kim pans to reveal the husband, which came as quite a surprise when I first watched it, and it suddenly makes the dynamics of the scene a lot more complex. And you know, it's, I don't want to intimidate you by what, showing you we're one of the master observational filmmakers, but you only may want to make a little bit of your film observational. And um, this session, we're going to get into a few guidelines about how to plan your self-shooting observationally. But um, they're just guidelines to refer to, to help you filming in the real world. And the main lesson to take from this clip is that Kim and her co-director got access to a place where they knew a scene would develop and would help drive the story forward. So getting into the exercises, I'm first going to teach you how to shoot a two way conversation, then how to walk with a contributor. And finally, we'll run through how to shoot a sequence. I'll give you some examples of a tr transitional sequences, we'll touch on that. The function of which is to allow the audience to assimilate information. And these are all important elements that will help you learn how to shoot a story. Because once you've diversified your techniques, you can then have more fun imagining how you're gonna tell your story. So these are gonna be our basic ingredients today. Okay, we're gonna get onto the story section right at the end. But just to give you a sense of what we'll end up talking about, to make a film sustain for more than a few minutes, you are gonna need a story. And for a story to work, there needs to be some sort of journey and some development. And ideally your protagonist needs to be figuring out a problem. And by the end of the film, there's some sort of solution. I'm gonna talk you through an example of this later on. And so let's first go back. Um, through to some of the touching on the techniques and the exercises that you're gonna to use to tell your stories or perhaps just try out one or two of them. So first of all, the two-way conversation. So this explanation um, is based on the assumption that you're gonna be shooting with just one camera. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you a clip of a two-way conversation, which is from my graduation film, Noah's Canoe, which will show some more clips from yesterday. So hopefully you'll begin to get a sense of how the story develops. And to film a two-way conversation effectively, you need to concentrate on what is being said and respond to it. The audio should always inform your shots. In most scenes, there'll be an element of drama. If you've been following what's been happening between the characters, you should be able to guess where the interesting pieces of drama and reaction will be. Now, keep an eye out during when you're watching this clip for when I hesitate with the camera. I hadn't really thought through whose point of view the scene would be filmed from, and I hesitated until I realized it's the doctor's point of view that I was interested in. So let's have a look. So at the time we were dealing with this abdominal pain and uh, it seemed to be that you were coming in a lot, like every month. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of unusual. I thought, why is this healthy woman coming in with abdominal pain month after month? And I think after we did a workup initially, once again, ultrasound, yeah. a couple tests. Yeah. I said, I think I'd even said one day, one appointment, like, why? Let's take a step back. Is there anything else going yeah. on in life? That you want to talk about this doesn't seem to add up and i think you said actually i think i'm transgender and i would like some help in the transition uh, to becoming a male which is not what i expected to hear the answer <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of fun and so i said to you i think jokingly i said well it's fine what happens this is a dime a dozen we deal with that all the time here in mid coast maine and you thought i was serious when actually i was <laughs> joking and I said, oh really <laughs> I know you. I'm not the only one. Yes, as a matter of fact, you are the only one. I've never had a patient ever undergo this, but I said, if, you, if you're willing, I'm willing to go through with you and bought some books, did some reading, some yeah. literature searches, and yeah. came back and we were off the races. So at the time, we were dealing with. Sorry, there we go. So I want you to start analyzing 
things that you watch. And there are two possible ways to shoot this two-way conversation. Other, there are more, but let's look at two. You shoot it all on a wide two-shot and you get everything which is being said. Or you decide whose point of view the scene is about and concentrate on their point of view, getting occasional reaction shots of the other person. Just so in this scene, I finally realized I was interested in the doctor's point of view, hence focusing on the doctor and only getting occasional reaction shots of Noah. So once you've decided on whose point of view the scene is um, being led by, concentrate on the lead person. The scene you're shooting is always going to be longer in reality than the selection that you make in the final film. Therefore, when there's a quiet moment during the scene, use this as an opportunity to pan across and get a reaction shot. You know, if you're worried about missing something, you know, do stay on your first lead character and pan across when it's a nice quiet pause. You can then edit this together as an integrated scene which feels observational. As you can see, I was sometimes a bit undecided and held on it, it was a slightly wobbly wide. What could I have done differently? Well, we were in a small room and it was hard to get back far enough to get them both comfortably in shot. I could have explained that to them and at the beginning before I began filming saying, I just want to check my wide shot. And once I'd seen it was a bit of a squeeze, I could have asked them to sit a little closer together. So some common mistakes to think about at the end of this first exercise, plan ahead ahead of time whose point of view to shoot. Check your wide shot and both individual framing decisions before you start shooting. Shoot enough reaction shots and vary your shot sizes. We're going to talk more about varying shot sizes later on. So that's the first exercise. Next, walking with your protagonist. So this is an example of establishing a main character in in her film, there were actually three characters, but we'll focus on the boy for now. And uh, during this section, we'll be talking about screen direction and entering and exiting the frame when you walk with your protagonist. It's a useful technique as it gives the illusion that the story is moving forward and you can convey information in an active transitional sequence. So these are the things that when I show you the next clip, I want you to look out for. So the medium close up, it begins, the scene begins or the introduction of the film begins with introducing our main character. So every time you take a shot, think about what is the intention of this shot. I want you to get used to naming shots and thinking about the intention of each. So the next shot, thinking aloud in your head okay it's a wide shot he's playing with his friends that's the intention to see him and his mates and it gives the location in text so we're going to we're not really going to have time to talk about crossing the line but we i'll show you screen just keep be aware of screen direction as you watch this clip and how the characters are all moving from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen he turns around, the boy turns around, and then she changes her framing to lower down so that she could create an edit point, a different shot, so she can create an edit point. And then she changes her shot again to a wide. Then we'll see the screen direction, it all cuts beautifully together you know, it's, it's a bit rough and ready, but that's what we like um, when we're all starting out. And they're all moving left to right. Because if you were on the other side of the characters, there'd be, the screen direction would be right to left, which is, would, they'd look like they were walking into each other if, if, we, if you tried to edit that together. So the character, filmmaker's staying on this side of all the characters. Then you'll see that uh, in the next shot, the camera allows the main character to leave the frame, which creates a nice edit point. And then she uses voiceover to set up a, um, the transition to the next scene. 
I'm then going to show you a two-way conversation. Um, it, that's the next scene. And um, it's sort of like a good excuse for you to do a little revision of the first exercise and for you to see how to link up a walking sequence with a two-way conversation. And you'll see that Alma Haral, the self-shooting director, decides to hold a two-shot. And um, she uses a cutaway of the pills. So she holds the two-shot. And um, just to let you know, this clip does discuss um, the child's struggles with behavioural disorders and um, medication. Let's have a look. Right there, look inside this. Well, this. Ew. Just one piece of gum. We're gonna have to climb over here. We were grounded for one week for throwing rocks at another child. You're fighting on the bus and you threw a rock at another child. Remember that? You hit her in the head and made her bleed. That was her head? Mm -hmm. I thought that was William because his head was bleeding. Was there was more than one. There was three actually. William, that was um, I know this one. What? Because this is for the cut. This thing is for cuppies. Yeah. And the black one. This one is to, it's Ritalin. What this one does, mm -hmm. is, you know when you run around a lot and you can't stop moving and you're very hyper? This is supposed to make you where you don't do that. It calms is you that down. New, Mom? No, that's not new. He's been taking that for almost two years. And this one, Resperidol, is for. Crazy. No, you're not crazy, sweetie. Don't ever think you're crazy, okay? So that was the end of the second exercise. And just before we move on to the third practical exercise, which is uh, the five shot sequence, I think it's always good to have a little nod to foundational influences in the field of independent documentary. And I just wanted to show you another walking with your protagonist clip from um, a film directed by Dick Fontaine and produced by Pat Hartley and it's called I Heard It Through the Grapevine. And um, the protagonist in the film is the author and civil rights activist James Baldwin. And um, throughout the film they do return to the sites of various memories which is, is a great technique to use in film. And the film is structured as a story that takes James Baldwin back to his deep South roots 25 years after the civil rights movement ended and to see what has changed. So let's have a look at this clip. Just a few things to watch out for when you're looking at it. So he's approaching the memorial to Martin Luther King Jr. And the cinematographer, and cinematographer Ivan Strasberg begins his shot with the frame empty. This creates an edit point to start the sequence with. And then Baldwin enters the frame. Also at the beginning of the shot, I just want you to have a quick look, at, look out for the transitional sequence. Uh, there's Baldwin in the center. And he leaves the frame at the end of this transitional walking sequence to also to create an edit point. And the voiceover used under this shot is extracted from a two-way conversation. So you'll see how he, the Dick Fontaine merged the two. It has probably done the most extraordinary, spectacular makeup job in the history of the world.
I was wondering what Martin would have thought of his Atlanta now. I did. All over the South now, there are Martin Luther King Jr. drives freeways, expressways, and there is the uh, monument in Atlanta, which is, this is a difficult thing to say, but I was sad. This is absolutely as irrelevant as the Lincoln Memorial. It is one of the ways that the Western world has learned or thinks it's learned to outweigh history, to outweigh time, to make a life and a death irrelevant, to make that passion irrelevant, to make it unusable for you and for our children. There's nothing you can do with that monument, somebody said to the widow. But we're confronting that. So, finally, the final exercise that we're going to look at today, uh, the five shot sequence. It's a commonly used teaching exercise which encourages you to consider framing, composition, angle, shot size, and how to use light. You want to be able to capture a character fulfilling an entire process. In this case, the character's eating breakfast while watching football. To do this effectively, you need to shoot a mixture of close-ups, medium and wide shots, but also be considering continuity. So this example was shot by a former student, Ni Saki Mills, um, who was one of the students in UCL. And um, he began his exercise with a tight close-up on the hands, or it could have been a medium, I guess, medium close-up. So the idea of shot one beginning on the hands is that you have something interesting to open the sequence with. Then this next shot of the face, a tight or medium close-up of the face, answers the question that was raised in the first shot of who is performing the action. And the essential part of storytelling is to raise a question and then quickly answer it. Question is whose hands? The answer is this person, this face. The next question in the viewer's mind is what is going on here? And a slightly wider shot can answer this. And then the fourth shot in the five shot sequence, over the shoulder. This shot might work better when the action is happening further away from the person with their arms outstretched, for example, if they're making a coffee, typing, or building something. Trying it out requires patience and thought about your composition. And finally, something else. After you've got the four shots specified above, work hard to come up with a fifth and different angle on the same subject. For example, getting lower onto the ground, altering the angle you're shooting from. So why shoot a five shot sequence? When you get to the edit, you're gonna to need to cut between different size shots in order to cover the scene. If you have shot from only one or two angles, you'll find yourself having to make jarring jump cuts in the edit. It's a rule, a 10 second rule. Um, Hold each shot for at least 10 seconds if you can. Um, literally count to 10 after you begin recording the shot. Do not stop shooting just because you reach 10. But often you need to hold the shot longer than 10 seconds to capture the action that you need to tell the story. 10 seconds is a minimum. It gives you plenty to work with in the edit. So, then when we get to the edit, the editing tutor on this exercise was Bonnie Ray Brickman, and she reflects 
having the shots is just the beginning. The challenge then becomes, what am I going to do with these shots? Whose story am I going to tell? What order do I put my shots in to tell a different story? Is it the setup or is it the reveal, for, in for instance? Once the order is decided, then the challenge becomes selecting the exact in and out points. <laughs> So let's just check. Oh, yeah, here we are. So if we look at the sequence again, it's worth noticing the in and out points she chose in order to cut together the spoon action with smooth continuity. So here you can see the last frame of the first shot has the spoon leaving the frame. And then the first frame of the second shot allows a space for the spoon to then enter into. So remember, you'll need a beginning, middle and end if you're filming an action, and you'll need to cover the action with close up, medium and wide shots. And this will help with continuity. If you're filming any process like baking a cake, painting a wall, changing a bicycle tire, you'll need to film the different stages of the process and then edit it down in the right order to abbreviate it so that it appears continuous. Filming and editing these sorts of actions helps understand the importance of filming the beginning, middle and end of an action so that you can show development in your scene or sequence. So the secret of editing is to make the discontinuous seem continuous, to make, broken up constructed, to make a broken up constructed account of reality feel smooth and natural. And jump cuts draw attention to the fact that we're manipulating reality and that's why they're generally avoided. So common mistakes just before we, we wrap up this section and get onto story. So common danger is to hoover the scene up and to let the camera roll, roam chaotically across the action and then find in the edit that there's no place to cut the scene down or no way to because the camera is always moving. It's why the discipline of learning the five shot sequence will draw your attention to the intention of each shot and help you understand the components of the story you're telling. If you're experienced, you can film the five shot sequence as one continuous shot. An example of why you'd want to do this is if you're also capturing some important audio at the same time. If they're talking or playing an instrument and you don't want to break the flow of the audio. The first rule of thumb is to be decisive and steady with your camera. Position yourself well. And if you're moving between shots, make sure you have a beginning and end to each of your shots. So here we go. Final part of the talk is story structuring. So the key difference between a five minute film and a 10 minute film is that you need to take the audience on a journey and there needs to be a beginning, middle and end to hold your audience's attention. This is the case for whatever genre you choose, observational or not. There ideally needs to be some sort of journey, a problem and a solution for your protagonist. Consider what events and activities will take place to provide development and progression for your story. Of course, you can't always plan this, it's real life, but it's always good to have this fundamental structure parked in the back of your mind so that you have choices and you can experiment with how to compile your scenes in the edit. So this was my final student graduation film from the NFTS. And my approach is to largely let Noah tell his own story. And we worked very closely together in a creative way, thinking about what scenes um, were happening in his life. And 
And as you can see from the previous clip um, that we showed earlier, he's transitioning from female to male. And um, the story is told from his point of view. And the themes that I was interested in are trauma, transformation, and it was in the end a, a coming of age story. So what's the journey Noah's going on? So ever since he was a little kid, he's wanted to work with his father, building canoes in the north woods of Maine. What's the problem? But this dream has always eluded him because for a decade he was incapacitated by physical illness. And in the film, the solution is that the story, that it's a story of Noah's transformation as he moves from a difficult past into a healing future, finding a place as a man in a family of his own. You can also begin to think in terms of what does the character want? What is the obstacle in their way? And what is the solution? You can write your film down as a story as well, to begin to think in this pattern. So the first clip, I'll just show you uh, four clips, I think, they're each about 30 seconds to a minute long. So, sorry, they're short clips, but just to demonstrate progression of narrative or story. Um, the journey. Our protagonist Noah wants to build boats with his father. And the emotion, think about the emotion you want from your scene. This one is anticipation. Ever since I was a little kid, I've wanted to work with my dad building canoes. So then what's the problem? How do we convey the problem or the obstacle in the story? This is a three-way conversation with his girlfriend, Laura, and his mother um, about 10 years of illness. The emotion is confusion. They're trying to figure out the problem. And the scene was shot from Noah's point of view, although his mother was sharing the storytelling and Laura's listening providing a reaction shot. And there were real physical symptoms and doctors would know that and they would, yeah. but they couldn't figure out why. And then the muscles in my throat were too big. They like overgrew over the trachea and like they were like, I mean, the whole thing was just a nightmare. And it was like, it was, we were lucky in Florida, somebody actually knew. So actually finally understood that why my throat was getting choked yeah. off. Thank God. That was like two years, three years in. Yeah. So when finally, figured out what was wrong with my throat, thank God, or I wouldn't have. I um, probably wouldn't have lived. It was just a complete physical manifestation of, it was showing me what happened. I was trapped in this prison that it could have, you know, and that's what it was. And it just turned into sickness until I figured it out. And there were real phys So, in my story, there was this realization of quite a large change, which was the transition, the gender transition. And so I decided to reveal this um, with this clip that actually comes after the three-way conversation. 10 years ago, I awoke to sickness and I've lived in it ever since. It was only recently that I've discovered how and why my body has spent a decade in this turmoil. The truth that has been so long hidden from even my own consciousness is that I am transgender. I am male, identified in a female body. The parts of me that are surfacing have been suffocated and tortured and are terrifying and terrified. I will now be going by the name Noah. Holly symbolizes protection and has served me well in that respect. Noah represents rest and comfort. I hope it too will serve me well, as I am so tired and scared. In regards to myself, I am using male pronouns. I have been waiting years for this. 10 years ago. So, and then finally, the final clip I wanted to show you um, is 
Noah stepping into his role as a husband and father. The solution or resolution. And um, I'm just going to show you one minute of this, but uh, Noah's just told us on camera that he's asked Laura, his girlfriend, to marry him. And um, this is Laura's son, Finn, on the right. And um, they're just about to tell Finn that um, they're thinking of getting married. And they agreed to let us film this on, on camera. So we were very, very much collaborating on this as a team and saying, is it appropriate? Do you mind us filming this moment? It's, it was happening anyway. They were planning to tell him that morning and they felt comfortable with myself and my sound recordist, Howard Perrier, uh, filming this moment, which was very generous of them. And uh, so the emotion is tension leading to relief and humor, I hope. It's just a minute or so. That's sick. I get this really hot and stick it in the river. Yeah. Awesome. You take the hammer and bang it different ways and then Thinks there's no coals. I'm incredibly non. It's like, what is that? Not all a bad thing. What about in the bed? Must have been working out for sweat that then. <laughs> we do not make a sound, young man. No, yeah, that doesn't mean you can't do it without a sound. Oh, really? You have a lot of experience. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's no flame. So, what do you think about Noah and me? So luckily, luckily he approved of the marriage. And the final clip I'll show you is a letter to Noah's father that he's written, saying that he's gonna let go of the original dream of going to work with his father, and he's gonna get married to his girlfriend. Um, dear dad, you've been watching me fight my way upstream over and over again to get to you in the canoe shop. You always reach out your hand as I crawl up the banking. I spent the winter as Noah, walking around in Holly's footprints, in her shadow in the snow, and looking into the openings of the stream where her face was so long reflected. She was a vessel holding me for nearly 30 years. Now she's a ghost roaming in those woods, and I have a great fear of leaving that landscape and the shop of leaving her behind. For now, in honor of you and the canoes, I will take the pressure off of a life up there in Piscataquis County and regular work with you. I will find my way with work down here in Rockland and come up at times. Oh, I think that's it, yeah. I'm dear dad. That's a clip. So yeah, thank you. Um, that's it. But a wrap up and here are a few book suggestions um, that uh, have been useful and by looking at these books you're going to find others and and um, the first two are particularly about documentary and the others the other two about story but thank you so much um, I'll just stop the screen share and um, sign off all right I'm happy to take questions thanks for watching Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the live Q&A section of Juliet Brown's workshop on self-shooting. Um, first of all, Juliet, on behalf of Doc House, uh, but also of all the audience who I know you can't see or hear them, but trust me, there's lots of them out there. Uh, first of all, just a huge thank you to you for such a fascinating and really detailed presentation. And thanks also for staying on now to um, take part in a QA. and a So uh, if anyone watching has questions for Juliet, you should be able to write them into the chat function which is uh, the, the chat box is 
uh, at the bottom of the screen below the kind of video player. I explained that really well. I'm sure you can all find it. Uh, so pop your questions there. If you want to tell us um, your name and where you're writing from, that's great. And if you don't, then that's also absolutely fine. Um, and I'll get, I'll relay as many questions as possible uh, to Juliet as we have time for. But Juliet, just before we take the first question, um, I think you wanted to add a final thought, uh, kind of in conclusion, uh, at the end of your presentation. So I'm going to hand over to you for that. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Um... So yeah, I realized I kind of ended the talk a little abruptly. Um, I was conscious of time and I just wanted to sort of wrap up. I mentioned shot sequences, scenes at the beginning of the talk. And I just wanted to summarize with the idea that your story is, or st some stories are built with a compilation of different sequences, which are built into scenes, which in turn reveal the whole story that you want to tell. And um, just to reiterate what was said at the beginning, this approach leaves the audience understanding the story by having actually experienced it. And they will have gone on a journey with the character and lived their point of view rather than being told what to think by the narrator or by a narrator. And these exercises were just to show you a few different kinds of ways that you can decide to shoot real events. And good luck. Um, and yeah, the slides are available. Um, they're they're going to be sent out, I think. Um, I'm not sure. Do you need to request them, Jenny, or how does that work? I think that we'll just send them to everybody who took part, or at least, I mean, everyone who's taken a ticket will at least get a, a link to be able to get them. Okay. I don't know the exact details, but everybody will have them there available. Um, and we've got some really great questions coming through. The first one I'm just going to lead straight into. Uh, the first one is actually about uh, Noah's canoe, which you've just been talking about in your okay. presentation. Um, and somebody has asked, how many people were involved in your documentary about Noah and what equipment did you use? So um, it was just me and my sound recordist, Howard Perrier. Um, so there were two of us. I was shooting and um, I used a, I think it was a Panasonic 151 or a Z150. I, 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 no, I didn't think it was Z150. It was a while back. So I think it might have been a 151. And um, small enough to hold, you hold it like this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it wasn't, um, I didn't use interchangeable lenses. And then the editor was Catherine Lee. And um, this, the composer was Leonard Bush. Um, so we, and then there was a sound designer, Tudor Petra from Romania. So the team at NFTS is fairly common for you to work with different specializations, which is a real, the real beauty of the MA though, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a great question next. How do you balance filming observationally with communicating with your contributors slash making them feel comfortable? Do you end up shooting, long question, do you end up shooting a lot more participatory footage that doesn't end up in the final edit? That's two questions. Yeah, I should be writing them down while I, while I listen. Um, so what's really nice is if you've got contributors who are creatives, which Noah and Laura are, they get it they get what you're trying to do and you have active conversations all the time about what are you planning to do today what do you think might be good to talk about if you're um gosh you know have it, one scene uh, laura's cutting noah's hair and um we talked about how they fell in love how they got together so we we kind of planned it together um which may be unusual and it means that there are fewer of my questions they are my voice is in the film but um it meant that i didn't have to drop in so many questions um because we we sort of knew what the theme of the scene was going to be and they're they're so great that they just sort of rolled with it whereas sometimes it's much more you might want to adopt a different style where you want to ask follow-on questions and it's more like a, I don't know a Louis Theroux style or you're you're really interrogating the character on camera and it's a completely different approach um and what was the second part of the question Jenny uh, do you end up shooting a lot a lot of more participatory footage that doesn't end up in the final edit actually um the planning stuff I usually am not filming um it's more just relaxed a chat 
um, at another time and just sort of thinking ahead. And for example, the letter that Noah wrote to his father, that was definitely his initiative and it felt like the right ending for him, for his story. Um, and in that way, it is very participatory, but the actual process of reaching that decision, I chose not to film. Well, I think you, you basically touched on the answer to this next question, but someone has specifically asked, how much did you structure uh, Noah's canoe in advance? Was it scripted or did you have a general idea and didn't know how things were going to end? Gosh, we had no idea actually um, how it was going to end. I totally wonderful that it happened um, when Howard and I were in the States that Noah proposed. Um, and I do believe, I, don't, I think it would be naive of me not to say that the camera being there is a catalyst for people's lives. And it does compel your protagonists and your characters to really be a bit more self-reflective than perhaps they might normally be because they are being filmed. And um, so we didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, he was, Noah was in a quite a difficult place at the beginning of um, our shooting period. He was finding it very difficult to go back up to um, Northern Maine where he wanted to continue building boats. Um, and so it was kind of like, oh, you know, it's very, it's a bit precarious to say the least filming real life, it's always precarious. And so the way that we were taught at the NFTS is to plan out, map out different possibilities in terms of a beginning, middle and end and hope you, you're constantly, you know, every night you're rewriting thinking, well, that could go there and that could go there. And, what's actually going on and, and it, it, you can't really control it as much as you know you'd like to. How long was your actual shooting period with Noah and Laura? I think for, it was a 45 minute film and I think we were there for about six weeks. Okay. Um, it may have been a little less than that but yeah something something around that. Uh, next, do you have any tips for adapting technically while shooting? Uh, for example, sometimes when I film, I come across technical issues and obviously don't want to lose the moment um, and in getting the best footage possible. Oh, well, this is when I do keep filming and I say, OK, sorry, I'm struggling with such and such or, you know, I forgot to turn the light on or, oh, it's gone completely dark. Can we turn a light on? And this is definitely when I, I begin to um, sort of actively participate with, with, with who I'm filming and say, look, I need some help here. Like uh, I need to change the card or the battery's dead or can I plug in and plug something in? And it, it's a very much a constant dialogue and, and not, I'm not mysterious or I don't like being mysterious about what I'm doing. I think it's very important to say, look, you know, I was hoping we were going to be able to film this and now the camera is dead and I think it might be the battery or it might be the cards run out or, you know, and I, I'm very transparent because I think that really helps. Trust is everything with observational filmmaking and probably filmmaking in general is with real people and real lives. It's, it's all about trust. So I sort of often do a running commentary on like if things are slightly, if I'm a bit like confused or like I'm sort of muddling, muddling through, I sort of say, okay, bear with me. You know, I'm just trying to figure out such and such. And everyone these days is so savvy. I mean, even my 80, 88 year old mother is like <laughs> fairly savvy with tech. So, you know, I think most people relate if you just explain what's going on. Better to share than to freeze up. Um, do you perhaps have any suggestions for disabled filmmakers who potentially can't travel to distant locations to obtain great shots? Yeah, that's a really great question. And um, it also, I mean, applies to, um, well, to lots of us now with these restrictions that we've got through COVID-19. It's something that um, we're all having to, to think about. And I, I was giving it a little bit of thought earlier about what you could film in these circumstances and also yeah if as a disabled person your own story might be wonderful to share if you were up for for doing that um who's in your bubble think about if there's someone in your bubble that you um you know might want to get to know better and make a film about um 
you could also another student we just had um, at the recent course asked um, a friend in Belgium to film on his behalf with a character that he wanted to make a film about. So he was directing another, um, it wasn't necessarily a filmmaker, but he was giving direction to someone else via Zoom and mm -hmm. they were making the film, but it was still directed by the director in the UK. And um, yeah, I think that was about it. I mean, the other one with, in terms of uh, COVID-19 and social distancing, uh, I know that's not, sorry, it's not the question you're asking, but just as the final point on what I was brainstorming was uh, filming outside is obviously um, if you're worried about social distancing. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, right, filming in outdoor open spaces. Okay, I've got lots of questions coming through, so I'm going to plow on with these. Um, can you, this is putting you on the spot, can you recommend some other observational docs from which to study this form? Oh gosh. Um, if that's too on the spot, maybe you could share afterwards. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think we were all, at film school, we were all told to watch Kim Longinato's films and they are wonderful. Uh, I think Women Make Movies is the producer. And um, uh, so the, the clip we showed from, I showed from Divorce Iranian Style is one of those. That's really good for observational. Um, and gosh, I'll have to give it some more thought. <laughs> um, because, awesome. yeah, I mean, it's a lot of films are kind of hybrid and not pure observational, which is why Kim's films are always used as, as a good example. Um, I'll, I'll mull that over while you give me another question. Well, that's abs absolutely fine. Um, how easy, oh, this is someone called Alva, we have a name, so I'll show that. Someone called Alva says, how easy or difficult? is it to get people's permission to film them in often very personal moments? And do you have any tips and tricks? Well, don't use tricks. Don't use tricks. I mean, just, um, just be very straightforward and honest with them and, um, and see if they feel their story is gonna, it's gonna be valuable for them to share it. Um, and if they feel it might be useful for, for us as a potential audience, to watch it um, and it's a tricky one it's a really tricky one because often you do film things and then people say oh god I'd really rather you didn't use that and then you have to you know cut the film together and see if it's possible to make a cut without that piece of material and in Noah's case I did I did give him the final editorial say which, you know, did feel risky, but absolutely I knew I had to do it that way with his particular story because it is so intimate and personal. But other directors do not take that approach and, um, you know, it really depends on the individual circumstances. But I, I would always try and be as transparent about your intentions as possible and, and also, um, yeah, and don't, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, London53 says, thank you so much for this. I'm joining uh, late in life, 53, uh, 53 years, and yet to make my first doc film. I can't thank you enough. What tips do you have for capturing quality sound and what editing tools do you recommend? And I'll just add in that someone else has also asked uh, about basic editing software that's not too expensive for those starting out, please. Mm. I mean, next workshop coming up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Next week, let's give Simon a plug. Um, we've the Doc House team are putting on another workshop this time next week um, with uh, about location sound. So I would rather defer to that workshop. I mean, I use when I'm self shooting and I'm only by myself. I do use a Sennheiser wireless microphone, and I think it's an ME sixty four and ME sixty six. Um, microphone on the top of the camera and that, that's pretty good but obviously if you've got the luxury of a sound recordist it's wonderful but most of us don't can't afford that a lot of the time in which case um, the self-shooting kit I'm, I expect Simon's gonna sort of go into more depth about about um, how to set that up editing software mm, I think maybe you could cheat and get the free trial for Premiere 
but I think nowadays it might just be a week, which is a bit tight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you think, Jenny. I, I'm, I can't remember what state iMovies, I, I've, I personally subscribe to Premiere because I do have to do a fair amount of editing. And I think you can just subscribe for a month or an annual, but I don't know about the, there definitely is some free editing software available like iMovie, but I can't think of any other programs without doing a quick Google. Yeah. Maybe people uh, can do that Google search and maybe there's some free trials out there. Just for but it's great podcast. that 53 keep, yeah, get cracking. <laughs> Um, okay, Tony says, hi Juliet, thank you very much. I wanted to ask, when focusing on a POV when shooting to a two-way conversation, where do you notice the right time to cut away for reactions without missing important dialogue? Yeah, no, this is a real tricky one and definitely something that I struggle with and um, we all struggle with. So it's about listening it's about listening and very very deep listening and thinking they're repeating themselves now perhaps because often people do repeat themselves like i've just done you know <laughs> and then you think oh great they're just repeating a point that you think you've got a nice take of it earlier and that's when to get a reaction shot or um a quiet moment, like if the doctor was looking at his computer and Noah was looking down at his hands or, or, um, but it was nice to get him laugh at the doctor's joke. And in that case, the third way of shooting a two way conversation that I was going to suggest was doing it with swipes between the two, but it is, it's tricky to do it well and with steady hand. So that's why I didn't really go into that. Um, cause I think leading with the, with the main point of view is the emphasis that you should be focusing on and yeah when there's a pause if there's a pause seize your moment yeah absolutely brilliant um isabel says can i ask you a little about funding how do you get funding for your docs do you make and sell them afterwards do you often get crew to collaborate for free this is a multi-part question or as a portion of profits if there are any <laughs> Um, profits and documentary don't go an independent documentary do not usually are not found in the same sentence <laughs> I I'm doing this PhD at the moment partly largely as a way to continue to develop my own um, practice and my own work and it's funded by London Arts and Humanities Partnership and they do offer 90 studentships, funded studentships every year. And it's funding for three years and then a fourth year for writing up. But in my case, I'm doing 70% practice film or um, practical. I'm quite st still figuring out what exactly it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And then 30% um, thesis. So that's how I'm doing it. But it's a great question because it's, it's something we're, we're always trying to figure out. Uh, film, uh, filmmakers and um, with the Ecoside film um, I was lucky enough to get Bertha Doc, uh, well Bertha Foundation to film it, uh, to um, sorry to fund it um, and NFTS kindly helped with production, uh, in-kind production f uh, faci facilities um, and so then I was able to pay my crew with that money um, and pay the editor, pay the sound guy and um, pay the composer and um, the sound designer. So it's, it's tricky. I mean, other friends in Europe, there are good film foundations, better film foundations in Europe. Um, I'm constantly have three or four grant applications open on my computer because the PhD funding just pays my stipend. It doesn't pay for actual production costs. So I'm always looking for different um, grants, uh, opportunities. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing. It's a sort of way of life, unfortunately. Uh, I think it's probably similar to being an artist in that way. But would you always look to have funding in place before starting filming on a, on a dock? Or is there ever a situation where you would have to ask crew to work without having funding in place to start off with? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I'm just doing a taster and I'd like to see if there's a story there and the funders usually very hesitant to commit 
with a large amount of funding until they can see the characters are in place you've got access access is key to getting funding um i would then then that's when you would say to crew guys do you have a day or two maybe you know it could be a little more time than that to shoot a development piece for um to show a, a that the project's in development and, and that you're actively um, pursuing it, then that's when you can boundary what you expect of a crew and say, look guys, obviously I'd love to work with you if we get funding bigger, a bigger amount of funding and um, let's cut this, let's do this taster together. And a lot of filmmakers are keen to help out and understand that docu the independent documentary filmmaking does often require everyone to have a bit of skin in the game in order for it to get some momentum and and um, get get the bigger funding proposals because yeah the funding proposals themselves can often take a few weeks to fill in yeah <laughs> part of the job uh, while uh, so going, going we're going back to uh, working with contributors and um, the next question is do you have any tips for making contributors comfortable as you film actuality shots and capturing them just being without making them so self-conscious that it alters their naturalism and they've given the example for example filming their hands or filming them making dinner I feel that as soon as you tell someone you're going to film them doing x they no longer perform x as naturally as they otherwise would yeah performance is a huge one so when you're um choosing your character for your film and i've had this happen to me several times where the character just won't stop talking and that's when you know that they're not the right character mm. for your for your project because there's literally going to be no breathing room there's going to be no they're not going to take a breath and that's when you know you know what the poor editor's never going to be able to just hear that pause and cut because they're they're just doing a monologue so you know we all know people who are like that and unfortunately they don't make great subjects because it's more like a um polemic you know it's not question they're not it's just a sort of rant often so one thing i'd really encourage you to do in terms of getting your characters comfortable and, and um, making sure you get those thoughtful shots or those moments for the audience to assimilate what's just happened and to think about is I've trawled through rushes forever looking for a quiet shot of a character just looking out to see or thinking. So I would encourage you to just again be transparent and say like just can we hang out on the beach or wherever you are for, you know, in that case, I'm thinking of the ecocide film. We were often on these very polluted beaches or if you're in your flat, just someone reading a book or I would just, I, I think it, it can be begin by being performative, but they'll get used to you. And after a few minutes, they'll kind of forget you're there. And then that's when you can get the quiet shots or the sequence of more reflective, um, film film filming that you might need yeah but i agree anyone who immediately strikes you that they're performing it's like okay this um it it happened with noah and laura once i asked them specifically to go on a walk and talk about something and they didn't it i didn't give them enough agency and so i think that really affected things and i didn't we didn't use it because it didn't feel natural yeah <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, next question. So we've got, uh, uh, there's about three more at the moment. Okay. In terms of time, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you always have your journey uh, slash problem slash solution, that kind of uh, the story, I guess, in mind before you start a documentary or do you discover it as the doc progresses and you learn more about the story? Uh, also, if the story slash direction of the doc changes mid filming, how do you deal with that? <laughs> all in 30 <laughs> seconds um yeah i mean you do need to get the initial even if you're doing a short film or in doing a taster for a longer film it's it's pretty important to know what the central obstacle is that when you do your research phase of knowing what your that you've got something that 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 is this character is struggling with and grappling with and that's going to give you the tension and the the 
the uh, traction to keep your story moving forward. Um, it may change. So, you know, at the beginning of Noah's Canoe, he was actually struggling a lot with alcohol. And, um, and then um, it kind of shifted to, um, you know, other things, other, though it sort of, we then realized the bigger problem <laughs> was the, you know, the, the gender transition was actually, that's what, but I knew that I knew that's what the film was going to be about. It was more a question of, as a director, how do you, we call it drip feeding. How do you drip feed your narrative? Uh, and so then you have the reveal of the problem. So you, you generally do have to plan that quite carefully. Yeah. Sorry, Jenny, there was a second part. To uh, what do you do if, um, if things change midway yeah. through? Yeah, well, no, of course, that it's, it's often going to happen um, in real life, isn't it? Um, I'm just trying to think of time. Yeah, I mean, often, sometimes the project flops, you know, and you just think, I've lost access, you know, or that, that or you, um, it, it happened to a student recently where he lost access and then he managed to negotiate a final half day of filming and um, they, they left it at that um, with the friendship intact. Um, so it really, dep it, you do often have to keep negotiating access on a sort of almost daily basis to check that your contributors are comfortable and happy and what, they, what they're comfortable to film at a, any particular moment. But yes, annoyingly, real life always throws up um, curveballs, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, a few more. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Do you have any advice for shooting a sequence with a contributor uh, that involves a lot of movement from them? For example, if they're walking, dancing, etc. Right. Well, walking, um, I mean, I was just thinking of a film we made in Canada and relating back to, you know, the question if you're in a wheelchair or something. And we in Canada, we were on a, I was sitting on the back of a toboggan and we were filming people walking with toboggans, but I wanted a nice smooth shot. So I was, I was actually sitting in the, in the, in a toboggan filming um, alongside with a friend kind enough to pull me along. <laughs> Um, dancing, I mean, ideally, if you can film with a friend and you've got a wide and a close two cameras, that would be wonderful because, um, and two different points. So with further than 30 degrees difference in point of view of the two cameras. So if they're too similar, they wouldn't cut, they would look very jumpy and wouldn't cut together very well. Um, Although it would work if you went from a wide to a close, that, that could work. Um, with dance, I mean, it's a bit like when you film someone playing an instrument. You, I think you've just got to commit to what it is you're, you know, if you're filming the finger picking on a guitar, um, then, you know, you just stick with that um, and then gradually move as the eye would travel to the other hand. Um, so make your movements intentional if you're, if you're worried about um, missing a beautiful moment or, or, um, if, it, or if you're miss, worried about missing audio. Yeah. Nice you, you make your moves usable, I guess is my tip. <laughs> um, another, another big question. How do you find your stories and what makes a good story to you? Gosh, I mean, I, I do um, tend to get interested in kind of, it always comes back to something to do with, with my life. I'm, you know, even if it's not clear, like say with the Noah's Canoe, I haven't undergone a gender transition, but the whole process of being at film school and having gone through a divorce and I was literally felt like I was stepping into a new skin. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's really crass to compare that to a, you know, someone who undergoes um, what Noah was undergoing. But 
I think as a director, you do need to find a way, even if you don't tell anyone else, and it might seem insensitive to, to voice that, but you do need to connect with your protagonist's story at some level, even if your story is completely different. Um, but so that you have a, some sort of empathy, like a huge amount of empathy for their journey. And I, I do trawl through my own life and um, my own therapy, my own kind of mistakes, my own family. You know, I, I tend to use themes that I'm fairly familiar with and then think about, okay, what's, what could I film to touch on or to really dig into that, those themes and maybe you'll end up making a different story, but that starting point does have to have some roots, I believe, in, in the way I approach my work in your own journey. That's, that is so useful and so interesting. Thank you. Uh, that would, I'm gonna squeeze in one more question, even though that would have been a beautiful one to end <laughs> on. Um, but I feel that every, everyone who's asked, um, I want to get as many in as we can, so we'll squeeze in one more if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Just, did you ever ask a subject to repeat what they've just said because you didn't capture it in the way that you wanted? Yes. Yeah, I would be lying if I said no. I, I think, again, it's about saying, oh, my God, like, Jenny, I'm, you know, I just missed your question. I'm so sorry. Like, I was faffing with something, you know, could you repeat it? Just being natural and, and um, then it, it may not work, but I think you've always got to try if you have that sinking feeling that you've just missed something. Um, you may like what happened, the line at the beginning of Noah's Canoe, we actually recorded that later about, you know, I've always wanted to build canoes with my father. We we felt like we ne that had to articulate the journey quite clearly. And there were a lot, there was a lot of, this debate at the film school about that, um, that it wasn't truly observational, but you know, it was the, became clear that the story needed to have a, a sort of refined focus at the beginning. And so I got a friend who was in the States, you know, I was no longer in the States. I was back in, in the UK. I went, got a friend to go and do several recordings with Noah and trying different takes of that sentence. And until they, got a got a good one yeah that's amazing oh Juliet that is that's all that we can fit in and that's all that we oh, have to room for um that was so wonderful thank you so much that was just thanks for such generous and um really fascinating answers um thank you for a great presentation oh, well lovely to be part of this and um thank you Jenny and all of the team at Doc House for doing this for all of us. I'm enjoying the other workshops too. <laughs> uh, which is a good note to remind me to say that the next workshop is with Simon Clark um, a week from today. Oh, and that this is uh, uh, in partnership with LDN, this one, and I didn't say that the London Documentary Network. So thank you very much to them. And sorry for not saying it earlier. And we'll say goodbye there. Thank you very much, Juliet. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>